bit of work on this. Sorry. That's okay. I forgot. <laughs> Um, I've been, been doing a little bit of work on this over the last few years with some people quite, you know, involved in, 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 in this field. So a bit of an overview of what I'm going to do today. So I'm going to start right at the beginning and talk about black holes in general. I think people normally find black holes pretty cool. And that normally gets everyone's attention. So we'll start right at the top. What are black holes? Why should we be interested in measuring them? I'll discuss the science case. So what we can, what science we can do by taking pictures of black holes. And the technique we use to do it is a pretty... It's a pretty complicated technique, but hopefully I can get it across and make people interested in it. And I'll discuss the benefits that you can get from um, conducting this, this particular radio astronomy technique from space. So, what are black holes? And, uh, you know, they're very cool, but why should we care and why should we, we be measuring them the way we are? So, so black holes were initially you know, hypothesized as a as a direct result of Einstein's theories of general relativity. Um, and in fact, Einstein himself did not believe that black holes could actually form in a real universe. So, you know, something that Einstein got wrong. Um, and then another mathematician, a man named uh, Carl Schwarzschild, he figured out that, you know, with some solutions to Einstein's equations for a, for a point mass, you could theoretically generate this, you know, this point in space known as a singularity. Um, where the curvature of the space time is, is infinite and you, know, you have a, a tiny object with an infinite density. We now know that you know, very likely they form from the death of a, a massive star, um, large enough such that you know, the gravitational force overcomes the electrostatic repulsion between atoms on the smallest scale. So it keeps collapsing in and in on itself um, as a gravitational force dominates the overall interaction between all the particles. Um, and then uh, you know, people quite, you know, it's sort of common knowledge now, this idea of an event horizon and uh, matter and light passing this boundary known as the event horizon can no longer escape. Um, and their masses then spread throughout the black hole and all knowledge of its form, you know, and, and what actually fell into this black hole um, is lost forever. So quite interestingly, from a sort of physics point of view, um, there's this theorem called the no-hair theorem. I don't know why it's called that, but it's basically this concept which states that all black holes can only be defined by three properties. And that's a, no, matter, no matter what black hole you have, you can define it by its, its mass, its angular momentum and electric charge. Um, so what's interesting from this point of view mathematically is theoretically, if you had two black holes with these same three um, properties, there'd be the exact same object, which is a bit of a weird concept. Um, and although this picture here, I don't know if some people might, might, might recognize this, it's from the film Interstellar. Um, and I included it because it's actually produced by a, a, a large group of physicists running real simulations of black holes. So the director was very keen to make it as realistic as possible. So it's actually a pretty good representation of what one might look, might look like if you were up close to it. It's a, it's a nice, it's a nice animation. So where are they, black holes? Um, and that, I think the actual answer now is, is everywhere, pretty much. There's actually an awful lot of black holes we, we now believe. I mean, originally people thought they'd be incredibly rare, but it turns out they form as a pretty common, you know, part of a start of a star's lifestyle, a life cycle. Um, so they likely form when a star of around two to three solar masses is at the end of its life and then collapses. And it's actually estimated now that there's around between 10 million and a billion black holes in the Milky Way alone. So you know, almost a billion black holes in, in our own galaxy, never mind others. But the supermassive black holes, um, these are, as, you know, as the name nicely describes, absolutely huge. And um, these have a mass of around, you know, between a million and a 10 billion times more than our sun. It's hard to get your head around some of these numbers sometimes. And um, these supermassive black holes are, are far rarer. Um, and this, you know, normally you only have one of these per galaxy at the very center of the galaxy and the whole galaxy itself forms around the black hole. But these are the ones that we uh, are imaging from Earth as very simply, they are huge. So we can take pictures of them far easier. So what science can we can we do with this information? I mean, it's always the question when you do this sort of, you know, it's interesting, but what, what use, is it, use is it of us, of it to us? Um, and by taking pictures of black holes, we can really determine the mass and the spin of the black hole. And this might sound like a very simple procedure, but from that alone, you can conduct these really detailed tests of general relativity, which is obviously Einstein's famous theory. Um, and there are inconsistencies in this theory. So testing it is still of, of real value to physics and just understanding in general how the universe works. Um, along that same thing, we can measure the behavior of space time around black holes. I think it's, it's sort of you know, public knowledge that when you get really close to a black hole, the gravitational you know, the force of it actually bends time and causes time to run faster from the observer's perspective there. So theoretically, if you could go and fly around a black hole, you could come back to Earth, you could make that journey. Um, time would have passed much faster for you and you may return to Earth, you know, with a few hundred years into the future. Um, so from that point of view, it's very interesting to measure how, you know, reality bends around a black hole. And then just bottom line, it's you know, fantastic to understand one of the most extreme objects in our universe. 
and, and this, this simulation actually is, is a simulation of a black hole passing in front of another galaxy and you can just see how light bends around it and you form this ring which we can still see from the observer so the light from that galaxy behind is actually going around the black hole sort of acts like a, a bit of a lens so how do we image them so a very long baseline interferometry is the technique that we use um, and i won't spend too long on this because i think i'll quickly get into too much detail and, and bore people but it's a, a radio interferometry technique and what you can imagine is we have multiple antenna so multiple radio telescopes positioned all around the world and then we can observe the same source on the sky the same target at exactly the same time and then by taking all this data and conducting a lot of processing on it we can generate this this virtual telescope with a you know we can get measurements of the equivalent of having a te telescope of the size of the earth so if you have two antenna on the opposite side of the earth and you image this this black hole that when you process the data you can end up with an image that you could have got with a telescope you know as big as the earth's diameter which you can imagine produces the sort of the, the, the greatest detail photos that we can get with any of our obs observatory techniques for astronomy I'm going to quickly introduce this concept of the UV planes, getting into the technical details a bit a bit more, but it's important for what I'm going to discuss later. Um, now, obviously, because we've got all these telescopes around the Earth looking at the same source, um, we do not necessarily image every single part of that black hole. Um, someone described it to me as if you can imagine um, imagine someone's playing a piece of you know a piece of music on a piano, um, and they start missing out some notes which they're hitting. You might be able to tell what the song is still, but you wouldn't have every single piece of information to figure out what that song was. Well, the way interfer interferometry works is very similar. So we can we sort of image parts of the black hole, and then we have to use a level of processing and very clever algorithms to fill in the gaps to generate our our final image. Now the very important thing here, and which is the only equation I'm going to show, so don't worry if the maths is, is going to bore you, um, is resolution. So resolution is really, you know, the detail, the smallest thing in our picture we can see, the, the smallest, the smallest detail in, in in the image. So that's our, you know, the main thing we're measuring here, the, the main the main thing we want to improve. And there's really because it's a very simple equation. There's only two ways we can improve the resolution of a of an image taken by a telescope, and that's either to observe at a shorter wavelength or increase the distance between our two furthest apart antennas. So if we've got two antennas, you know, 10 kilometers apart and two 100 kilometers apart, the two that are 100 kilometers apart will produce a much more detailed image. Now that does mean obviously that when we have ground-based um, telescopes conducting interferometry, they're inherently limited because obviously you cannot get wider than the Earth's diameter. And then hence, you know, I'll discuss going to space to solve that problem in a minute. But then, like I said, we have this sparse coverage of the UV plane, so you have to generate the image using some additional assumptions and algorithms, some very, very clever processing, and it's very demanding, so you've got these massive computers conducting this, and then you begin to generate photos um, from the data that you've measured. And this is a simulation of a black hole on the right. So, the Event Horizon Telescope. So this is the, the organisation that have been in the news an awful lot of the past three or four years, as they were the first people to... Um, you know, conduct imaging of a black hole and provide us with that famous image, which I'll show again in a second. And this is the, the group of telescopes they use, so you can really see how they're distributed all over the Earth. Um, so all these, you know, all the yellow names are, is, a, is a different radio telescope. And they all observe these two massive black holes at the same time. And then the data was processed to produce these famous images. Um, and the data they produced was absolutely massive. They were generating about, you know, they observed over seven days and they generated terabytes of data. Um, and just to give you an idea of how much that was, it was actually the way they, you know, they have to bring all the data to one place to do all the processing. Um, it was actually quicker to send that data by mail, by post, than it was to do it over the internet. So that's how much data they were generating for these images. So this is the, the famous famous image that they produced, and this is released a few years ago now, 2017. Um, and this is of M87 star, and this is a supermassive black hole at the center of the M87 galaxy. Um, and it's absolutely huge. It's 6 billion times more massive than our sun. Um, and I'll discuss some of the features you can see here a bit later on, but uh, although it may look like a very, you know, a very blurry image to, to people, there's an awful lot of science which can be conducted from, from such a picture. Um, so in the center here, we have what's known as the shadow of the black hole. And you know, this outer ring is, is essentially the event horizon, which is what we're, we're seeing here. And then the, the glowing around the outside is this, is this feature known as the, the accretion disk. And this is all the stuff that's falling into the black hole. Essentially, as it gets closer and closer together, there's, there's friction in these objects. They, they break down, they burn up, and end up with this very, very hot disk around the black hole, which emits these very um, bright, um, this high intensity light. And um, this is in the radio wavelengths, so we, you know, we have to we convert it slightly so we can see this with our own eyes, but we do the measurements themselves in the radio, um, in the radio bands. 
So the second image, this is produced far more recently. I think it was only only sort of last couple of years this was released. This is the image of Sagittarius A star, and this is the black hole at the center of our own galaxy, actually, so at the center of the Milky Way. And it's much smaller than M87 star. It's only 4.3 million times that of our sun. You know, so a good few orders of magnitude smaller than um, M87 star. Um, and it's actually a bit of an ongoing question in physics as to why our own why our own black hole in our galaxy is so small as supermassive black holes go. Um, you notice here a bit of you know, slightly less detail than we have in the other one, um, and that's actually because we have some we have lots of problems observing our own black hole because we if you can imagine we have to look sort of into our galaxy and there's an awful lot of stars and, and matter and dust in the way and that causes all sorts of problems for the light as it gets you know makes its way to us. So this was a real achievement even to get this level of detail for Sagittarius A star. So space-based field BI. So everything I've shown you so far was conducted with a group of ground telescopes, um, nothing in space. It's a very demanding thing to do on the ground, let alone do it in space. Um, but there are some massive benefits um, that come from doing this. So why observe from space? So like I said before, this goes back to that, you know, the one equation I'm gonna show is resolution. And there's only two ways to improve the resolution of a VLBI array. So we can increase the baseline length, which is that maximum distance between our telescopes. So if we go back to this picture here, of the array. So the, the resolution you get will be that maximum distance between two of these locations. And obviously on the earth, you just can't get any wider than S, you know, between SPT and, and the PV. Um, but if we take a, you know, if we obviously, if we, if we put something in orbit around the earth, the baseline lengths can get huge, you know, far more, you know, far wider than the diameter of the earth. So that's one way. And then the other way we can um, improve resolution is to reduce the wavelength we're operating at. And just due to the atmosphere, there is another limit on this. So we cannot observe above 350 gigahertz from the ground because the atmosphere absorbs basically all radio waves at a, at a shorter wavelength than that. So to reduce the wavelength beyond that, um, we have to go into space. There's just no there's just no way around it at all. Um, and the EHT now, the Event Horizon Telescope, is really reaching the limit of what it can possibly do just from a physics point of view. So these are the reasons why it's worth doing. So the past of space VLBI. There have actually been a couple of missions that have performed this, um, but only a couple. It's a very, very demanding application and not easy to, not easy to do at all. So the first one was, um, well, the first dedicated space VLBI mission was the Russian radio astron Spectre R spacecraft, which is this one on the right at the top here, a big 10 meter deployable antenna. Um, it's one of the first spacecraft to have an onboard atomic clock. Um, and that's another key requirement of VLBI. Um, and it was in this very highly elliptic Earth orbit where it had a, an apogee, so the farthest distance from the Earth, of around 340,000 kilometres, so really huge orbit. It went right out past the Moon, um, and they had all sorts of problems, actually, with the perturbation from the Moon, um, causing the orbit to change on a regular basis. Um, there were limitations with the spacecraft. There really were, so it was a thruster-based astute control. Um, so for those of you who are familiar with sort of AOCS, it does have a limitation on how accurately you can point the telescope. Um, and it only performed VLBI between the space between space and the ground. And at a fairly low, a low um, sort of downlink rate, so it wasn't, they were limited to how much, how long they could perform imaging for before downlinking to the ground. Um, that mission ended in around 2019, and they lost contact. Not sure why, but that was just the end of the story. Really, they couldn't get back in contact since then. And I won't go into much detail about VSOP Hauka, but this was a Japanese mission. Um, it was due to be a, like a technology demonstration for the Japanese Space Agency. And then at the last minute, rather than just flying, you know, a lump of concrete or something to the payloads, um, the radio astronomers of the world said, well, why don't you fly a VLBI mission? Because we we're ready for it. So you might as well make use of the platform. Um, so it's sort of a bit of an ad hoc last minute decision to make it a VLBI platform. Um, but it, it, it itself also did some pretty incredible science. So this is one particular result from Radio Astron that you know, one of the some more famous images that it produced. And again, it may look like a big blur. But uh, if you really understand what this is showing, it's quite remarkable. So what we have here is a radio galaxy. So 3C279, a nice catchy name. Um, and up here, we have this active galactic nuclei. So you know, a supermassive black hole in here. And it produces this, this jet into space, which we can see. Um, and then radio astron was actually able to resolve you know, the structure of this jet and show that it's like this helical structure, a bit like a DNA, you know, twisting like that. Um, and there's all sorts of um, ongoing on, ongoing science to determine exactly why it forms this way and what's happening in this in this nucleus here to, to generate the structure. Um, and then there's some more science conducted about you know, with the, with po the polarization of the light as well, which is a bit more a bit more complex. Um, so yeah, Spectra R and VSOP Hauka, they both conducted ground to space VLBI. So as I just you know explained, 
when you observe from the ground, you are limited as to what you know frequency you can go above. Um, so that was a real limitation for both missions. Um, and, and because of this, and since since Radio Astron, there have been no, you know, there's no current active space if you're behind missions. So the proposal, really, um, what I've been working on the last couple of years with a, you know, quite a large community of people. Um, the proposal is, you know, it's for a space-based VLBI system that would observe at sub-millimeter wavelengths. So radio astron observed at centimeter wavelengths and, and sort of 10, 20 centimeters. Um, this is a proposal for a sub-millimeter, so really, really short wavelengths. And it's the potential to offer an order of magnitude improvement on the event horizon telescope and produce images of, you know, 10, you know, 10 100 times better orders of magnitude improvement. And then on the screen are just two very basic CAD concepts that I, you know, I, I, I mocked up last year, um, just showing roughly what sort of spacecraft this may look like. And you can probably see how this one is quite similar to Radio Astron, big deployable antenna, and the bigger the antenna you know, is, is the better. Um, and then on the right is this phased array concept where you have lots of little antennas and you sort of combine the results to generate the effect of a large one. But um, the, 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 aim, the ideal here would be really to conduct VLBI on space to space baselines. So having both the, but having all of your antenna in space and then you haven't got to deal with the ground problems at all. But it's a really, really challenging mission. Um, and some of the things that are required for it aren't currently technically possible. So we're talking about, you know, a, a future mission here, something that needs to start development now in order to be ready in, in, in a, you know, a few years time. So some of the main challenges from a spacecraft design point of view, you need incredibly accurate orbit determination for space-based VLBI. Um, ideally similar to the wavelength of light you're observing at, which obviously for sub-millimeter is, is not possible at the moment in space. Um, so to get even less than centimeter accuracy orbit determination requirement, um, we can't do that just quite yet, even, even within sort of the GPS range. Um, so that's one major challenge that's coming up. Thermal control, a bit like the James Webb Space Telescope, you have to recall all of the electronics to a really low temperature, likely talking about a big sun shield similar to James Webb. Um, and then data handling is the, is the real killer, I think, when I think about this problem. Um, like I told you, the EHG generated terabytes of data there to post it back to the central, the central processing um, you know, laboratory. How you download that data from space, how you even store it on, on orbit is a real challenge. And then also just um, an atomic clock is required on board, which is also no small feat. And only a few have flown in space um, to date. Um, and again, this is another another difficulty. But there's some quite nice simulations here, and these are from the presentation I saw over the last few days at the, the um, Space Field BI workshop. Um, and these are just some depictions of the sort of you know sort of images you might be able to get with a Space Field BI system. And you can see how much more improved the image is here. You know, you've got far more detail of the accretion disk. You see the spirals of it. You can see the you know, elements of the magnetic fields, um, and then just some variation and you know, how that image can be improved. Um, with more telescopes and, and um, imaging over longer periods of time. So there are some real, real improvements you could make by doing this. So, yes, my involvement so far in this project. So I presented a paper at the International Astronautical Congress uh, in Paris last month, and then I attended the Next Generation Space Field BI workshop. I actually only got back yesterday. Um, and this is for this proposal of a sub-millimeter space-based field BI system, which is known as THESA, so terahertz exploration and zooming in for astrophysics. And this was submitted as part of an ESA proposal um, a few years ago, but was sadly rejected for that. Um, they think they were you know, aiming for too large a mission for this kind of application. Um, but like I said, aiming for an order of magnitude improvement on the um, event horizon telescope resolution. And the thing I've been particularly working on over the last year or so has been the design of a mission like this, a mission concept um, like this, but specifically for detecting a particular feature of the black hole known as the photon rings. I'm going to talk a little bit about that now. So the photon rings, this is a quite a nice diagram. I had a video of this, but I couldn't quite get it to work, unfortunately. Um, you have this sort of black hole in the middle here, this, this, this sort of sheet down the bottom is showing the, the, the curvature of space time. And then what happens is as photons, you know, light is traveling through space at the speed of light. Um, it experiences this really extreme deflection due to the immense gravitational force you know, in the vicinity of the black hole. And then depending on its approach to the black hole, it completes like different number of orbits around it, and then it makes its way to the observer. Um, but what's really interesting is because this is light getting you know, fired at the black hole and then you know, deflected towards us who is looking at it, the photon rings actually have are this delayed snapshot of the rest of the universe, but like from the perspective of the black hole. 
and they form this photon ring feature, which we see as the observer. So you can see on the screen here, it's sort of showing what you'd see from you know, looking at the black hole from a distance. And you get this ring, ring-like shape, which is what we're trying to detect here. And currently the Event Horizon Telescope cannot do. So just going into the detail a little bit, I won't go too far down, but this is what I've been working on. Um, so we want to try and detect these, these photon rings. And this graph on the right here shows the sort of the data you get from a VLBI mission. And basically what it boils down to is if you can make, whilst you're observing the black hole, if you can make the distance between your two telescopes vary from around 10,000 to 100,000 kilometers, so increase to from 10,000 to 100,000 whilst you're imaging the black hole the whole time, you can detect the photon rings, you can measure the diameter, um, and from that you can do all sorts of science um, for, uh, on the black hole itself. So what, what I did is I began to come up with some various orbit configurations. Um, so we'll really get into the you know, sort of spacecraft design and mission analysis aspect of it now. But I came up with some orbit configurations that could be used um, to conduct this particular application. Um, and the first configuration is one based in Earth orbit. And I tried to get a nice range so you could, you know, from a mission analysis point of view, there are a few variations that could be taken into more detail in the future. Um, so you could imagine two circular coplanar orbits of you know, 40,000, 48,000 kilometer radius as shown on the right here. So both space telescopes are orbiting the Earth and they're orbiting in opposing directions. So they're going around like this. And then over time, um, the sort of distance between the two spacecraft, so the longest and shortest is shown by the red here. So you go from the shortest to the longest in about a 10 hour period and you achieve that variation in distance between the two that we need to detect the photon rings on the target. Um, the benefits of this is far superior. You know, it achieves a resolution far superior to that of the EHT. Um, and there are some nice benefits of this of this configuration. So we're quite close to the Earth, you know, relative to what I'm about to show in a second. Um, so the downlink rate of data is you know, is, um, is, is, is is far higher. The achievable data rate is far higher to the use of the optical optical communication systems, and you get some rapid coverage of that UV plane, which I showed you earlier. And if you compare this to the EHT one, which is fairly sparse, we have a pretty pretty expansive coverage now. So the main challenge with this configuration is um, thermal. So um, obviously we have a, a lot of heat coming from the sun that we have to protect the spacecraft from, but there's also a fair bit of thermal emission from the Earth itself, both from in the infrared range and also albedo, the albedo effect, so sunlight reflecting from the Earth's surface up to the spacecraft. Um, so it's likely you need some sort of sun shield to protect the spacecraft from the, um, the solar flux, but uh, shielding from the Earth is a bit more complicated um, as you won't always be in a constant position with respect to the spacecraft. And uh, some more thermal analysis needs to be done really to see whether you could even feasibly achieve the temperatures I was talking about earlier, so, you know, nearly absolute zero, um, this close to the Earth. So the other configuration that I looked into was one at the Earth-Moon L2 point, and this is very similar to the orbit that the Lunar Gateway will operate in, so the, um, you know, the, the European Space Agency mission to support the to support the moon the moon landings. Um, but for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Lagrange points, um, and these are they're, they're five positions in space which arise from basically solutions of um, when you have three massive, you know, two massive gravitational bodies. So that's it. For example, here we have the sun in the middle and the earth is shown in this purpley color. And then at these five positions, so L1 to five, the gravitational and centrifugal forces um, balance out. And theoretically a third, a third object, so like a little spacecraft um, would remain stationary at these points. In reality, there are lots of things which mean this isn't quite, quite true, but around them, we get these nice stable orbits um, which we can use to our benefit and lots of missions have done in the past. So this particular configuration works in the Earth-Moon Lagrange 2 point. So you can imagine on this diagram here, if this yellow object in the middle was the Earth and the, and the purple one was the Moon, we're operating around the L2 point here. And these are known as halo orbits, as I think the name came from the shape they make above the planet that they're orbiting, so it's similar to a halo. Um, and then you can see over time how this configuration changes, how the spacecraft move on the orbit. We have one in the in the red orbit, one in the yellow. Uh, at zero, at sort of time equals zero, the start, start of the observation, they're very close together at the intersection. And then over the next five to six days, they move further and further apart, and we can achieve that variation in distance between the two. Now, the nice benefits to this one are thermally, now we're miles from the Earth, so the effect of the Earth's heat um, output is basically you know, negligible, we can ignore it. Um, and the moon itself has very low thermal emission and is very small, so it'd be far easier to cope with this from a thermal perspective and achieve those less than four Kelvin receiver temperatures. Um, but we are, of course, now, again, on the flip side, further from the Earth, so communications would be you know, far more difficult, although um, some optical communication systems have been demonstrated now at lunar distances up to almost 622 megabits per second, which is 
very high rate. So op optical comm systems are a real potential for this application in the future. And the final configuration that I um, sort of studied and, and, and proposed as, a, as an alternative in the future was making use of the Sun Earth L2 point. So if we go back to this previous diagram, we imagine this is now the Sun in the middle and the Earth. We're now at this, this second L2 point, but in the Sun Earth system. And this is the same location that um, the James Webb Space Telescope uses and other missions have used in the past as well. And for the primary reason that you can get this really stable thermal environment there, because you can always keep the sun behind you and have a big sun shield like the James Webb Space Telescope does and always observe away from the sun direction. Um, but the primary issue with this application for, sorry, with this orbit for our application is the extremely long periods. Um, so for a halo orbit around L2 in the Sun-Earth system, um, the period is between 80 and 180 days. And the, you know, this massively reduces the availability um, of the system to conduct this photo moon detection because you've got to wait, you know, you've got to wait that whole period of time before you go back round and can start again, which 180 days, you're doing it only twice a year and you'll never get a mission funded for that little, um, that little availability. But just to show what you know what could be done at Sun Earth L2 for this particular application, I selected these kinds of halo orbit, which are very low periods, as you can see here. It's only about seven to nine days for this particular orbit. Um, and this makes a very close approach to the Earth. So this is the Earth, this tiny dot down here. And it's quite it's sort of combines the benefits of the previous two configurations um, in that when we're far from the Earth, we have this thermally stable environment and we can get those really low receiver temperatures, we can observe away from the sun, and we can do our black hole imaging. And then as we come back around and we want to downlink our data, we make this very close approach, which will be beneficial to achieve the highest highest data rates. Um, but then here's the UV coverage of that as well, although it's not as, um, as good as the Earth orbit configuration. So just to conclude, um, so the future really for, for this application is, is a, there's a wide there's a wide community of people working on this, um, including the members of the Event Horizon Telescope organization themselves. So they're very keen to get something like this funded so they can you know, include a space-based antenna in their own array and improve their own images. Um, but it's, you know, like I said, a really challenging application. Um, and, and although these challenges remain, um, they seem fairly surmountable with you know, with, with a, you know, a modest level of technological development. And I sort of listed the worst case scenarios from a technological point of view, and there are some workarounds for some of these issues which are, are being looked at. An interesting idea, I think, is the potential for you know, a small satellite low Earth orbit constellation. And some people have looked into this as, 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 a, as an option for getting something like this up into space quickly. You know, it'd be far, far cheaper than a, a massive flagship NASA mission. So that's, that's one option. Although it's still a very demanding application for a small satellite, it's certainly worth exploring, I think, even for you know some level of degraded performance. Um, but these, you know, this sort of mission really has the potential to open up a, a new era of um, you know, astrophysical observation um, you know, on, on, on par with how many of these large observatory missions have done in the past, like James Webb, like Hubble. Um, but yeah, no matter what form it comes in, whether it's a small satellite mission, a, a, far, a bigger flagship mission, it would be you know, fascinating to be able to allow, to allow us to further understand some of these really extreme objects in our universe and conduct some you know, amazing science as well. So yes, keep an eye out for VLBI in the future and see if you see this mission you know, be realized at some point. Um, and it'd be a very, very exciting time for science if it ever is. Um, I hope people found that interesting. I'm happy to answer any questions that they have um, on this, um, anything at all. So thank you. Thank you, Ben. Has anybody got any questions? I was wondering, um, so you've talked about imaging of very large uh, black holes. What other, I'm sure you know of other features, so what, is there any other um, astronomical objects or features that you think a space-based VLBI will also be able to provide exciting insights for? Yes, good question. So I think actually one of the big, one of the big hurdles to overcome at the moment with like a proposal such as this is to convince you know, the community that there is more that you can do than just image black holes. So obviously there's a, expensive missions you need to justify more than that you think about james webb and they can you know they're, they're everyone's all the scientists are happy with james webb because they can all, all astrophysics can take something from what they're from what they're providing so that's really part of the challenge of getting these sort of missions accepted um but from this point from a you know, space-based field bi point of view it's not as wide ranging as something like james webb fundamentally and um, but there's an awful lot you can do with it so we obviously have our black hole physics um but then really you can image anything which emits you know brightly in the radio wavelengths. Um, so that's active galactic 
act, active galactic nuclei. So rather than just looking at the black hole itself, you sort of zoom out a bit and look at that whole the whole core of these galaxies. Um, and there's loads of science around how they how these form. We really don't understand how they form. Um, there's uh, science we've done around masers. Um, these are sort of again high radio emitting um, regions of space, in, you know, and we can actually you know, decompose sort of how these mazes are formed and what elements are included in the, in the maser itself. And then actually, in, in general, you can conduct a complete sort of radio survey of the sky, which is a you know is useful in itself as um, radio emissions. We've, tell, tell you an awful lot about. We've the, got uh, someone with a hand up, so oh, feel free to talk. Um, hi, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you fine. Great. Uh, so my name is Lord. I'm, the, I'm speaking from Ghana. Um, I was curious about the space-based uh, VLBI. Uh, my specific question was uh, like, what would be the minimum uh, surface area for a um, like a single uh, unit of the VLBI? If yep. that makes sense. Yeah. Like the size of the antenna. Yes. Yes. Uh, whether whether it's a, a single dish or it's um, uh, smaller dishes, like what would be the um, the smallest um, surface area? Yeah, good question. Um, so like I said, it's really one of those things that the bigger you can get it, the absolute better. Um, but there are obviously massive limitations on what you can fit inside of a rocket, or what goes inside the launch vehicle when you fold it up. Um, most studies look at 10 meters, 15 meters is sort of the upper limit of that. Um, there have been some people talking about trying to do it with a four meter dish, a four meter antenna, four meter diameter. Um, it's quite detrimental to the science because you're not quite as sensitive to the sort of weakest signals. Um, but I think a, a, I think a four meter would be the minimum you could get away with as an absolute minimum, and really you'd like to go as big as possible. And there's been some people looking into you know assembling these antenna in space and having truly massive you know 30, 40, 100 meter um, telescopes. You know these really sort of forward looking ideas. Um, but yeah, I think four meters is probably the minimum you'd want to do. Preferably bigger. All right, thank you. Welcome. Great. Any other questions? Hello. 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 Uh, yeah, I'm Yong Sok Chong from the Australia. So um, I think that the alignment in the L2 is really hard, and then it can reduce the um, the accuracy of the light rings. So how could you solve this problem? So to make the make sure the alignment of thousands of satellites. So how could we make the um, how could we solve the problem of sort of pointing and knowing where our satellites are in? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. And like I said, we, we for VLBI, you need to know where your antenna are to ridiculous accuracy. Um, there are some solutions even for out L2. Um, the, the most important one is what we really need to know is where the spacecraft are with respect to each other. So it's not so much about where they are with respect to the Earth. So what you could te theoretically do, and this is what I think the most likely solution, is have a satellite link between the two telescopes. Um, I don't know if people are familiar with the LISA mission. It's a European Space Agency mission which could kind of detect gravitational waves. And they have this big laser between the two spacecraft over hundreds of millions of kilometers. And they can actually measure the accuracy of this the length of this laser over 100 million kilometers to only a few centimeters, which is amazing. Um, if you had something similar like, similar to that between the two telescopes whilst they're observing, that would be sufficient to um, process the data. So that's I think that's the, the best chance of a solution. And you could combine that with like observations from the ground, laser ranging from the ground, and um, you'd, be, you'd start to get close to the accuracy that you need. Um, but that's you know, not an easy thing to do. But that, I think that would be a part of the solution. Um, could I do the follow-up question? Yeah, of course. Yes. Um, nowadays, the James Webb um, telescope also got the broken from the debris in the space. Yes. So is there any yeah, replacement or yeah, fixation for the your satellites? Yeah, another good question. I think... It's a good question. I haven't thought about this in too much detail. Um, I think if you had a large antenna, you would design it, you know, you design the surface accuracy such that you could still do imaging with some degradation of that surface. So James Webb were very unlucky to get a fairly sizable micrometeorite that early in the mission. 
Um, but like any spacecraft design, you know, you could over, you could over engineer it to some extent. You could, you could design it to the worst case scenario. Um, and I think you'd have to design your antenna in such a way that you could cope with a fair few impacts of micrometeorites um, and still observe. Um, and that'd be related to the accuracy of the surface and how big the antenna is and, and that sort of thing. Um, you could shield it. I mean, you could have a big, some, 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 some astronomy missions have had big structures around there and you know, around there. They're sensitive opti optics to try and protect them from micrometeorites. But no, no matter what you do, at some point you have to have an opening so the light can get in. Um, but you could also do that. Okay. Thank and you very you, much. And if it was a constellation of satellites, if you lost one of them, it wouldn't be mission over. It just might be a slight drop in performance. True. I guess uh, until you got to a critical point where it essentially you, you lose too much performance. Okay. Yeah. Very. Which is the advantage of kind of synthetic aperture radar kind of systems isn't it? it gives you that little bit of redundancy exactly yeah that that one that idea i showed with the sort of phased arrays you know the, yeah. all, the diff, all the little ones if you lost just one of those it's not the end of the world at all you yeah. can you can actually keep operating that right down until the last antenna you know it wouldn't matter um so that's exactly that's a good idea okay cool any other questions That's a really fascinating topic. A lot of, a lot of critical developments got to come yeah. in. So that the, as you talk about the data, the data volumes, so I'm guessing we're going to have to start thinking about maybe processing them on board to get the data volume down, rather than absolutely, rather yeah. than trying to uh, process that vast quantities. So and like you say, the high accuracy and the distance measurements. So yeah, really fascinating talk. So if no one else has got anything, I'll just move on. So thank you again. Um, thank you very much. And um, uh, so moving on. So yeah, the open source satellite um, program um, is open for people to join us um, and so you can be a more active contributor if you wish you could sign up and get updates as to what we're doing you could contribute to projects in areas such as software uh, marketing and hardware um, if you're working on a mission or considering developing a mission you could be an early adopter um, if you're working on something really interesting and uh, uh, interested in open source we'd be very welcome to have guest speakers to talk about what they're doing in their space missions so do just get in touch if you'd like to join in on our, our monthly session and speak about something of interest we'd love to get more hosts from other organizations involved um, as it brings extra dimensions and different perspectives or you can sponsor us so next month uh, well ne it's not quite next month so instead of doing this uh, the uh, third week of November. We're delaying by um, three weeks. We're going to meet up on Thursday, the 8th of December at half past four GMT. And we're going to do an OSAT review slash update. And we're hoping to um, have some really good news on how we're getting on with those OSAT. So um, the OSAT development. So please do join us then. So this is going to move for completely from the science end to more hot, um, to uh, actual satellite development stuff. So please join us then and sign up. Hopefully we will resolve any Zoom issues um, by then or have an alternative solution in place. But thank you very much for your time. And again, many thanks to Ben for speaking today. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thank you.